Welcome back to the Super Data Science Podcast, everybody. Super excited to have you back here on the show. Today, we've got a very special guest calling in from South Africa, Tienes Barnard. Tienes, welcome, my friend. Super pumped to have you here. Thank you, Kirill. Very, very excited to be here. Yeah, it's just such a random thing. Like when uh, we met at Data Science Go, um, I was so cool. Like, because I love South Africa. I, I lived in Zimbabwe for a while. So I was like, yeah, that's awesome. Somebody from South Africa called and tell us a bit about that. How, how, how did you, that feel for you? Like, uh, you know, just randomly meeting people from all over the world. No, it was, it was amazing. I, 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 let me maybe start off when I, when I met you, it was, I couldn't, couldn't believe, I mean, I've always had this, this uh, aspiration to be on the podcast show and, uh, and it was a bonus to hear that you're from, from Zimbabwe. So that was, uh, you know, originally, um, so they, to have that in common was great. And, mm -hmm. um, on, on the topic of conferences, we, I think I told you we had a conference um, in South Africa, a virtual one a few weeks ago. So it was, it was amazing to see what you guys did with your platform. Uh, and the networking aspect is amazing, um, just to meet people from all over the world. And uh, we're lucky to, to have gotten that opportunity. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Who, uh, can you give us some examples of like, who, who did you meet uh, from, from which countries or what, what professions? Sure. So uh, I met um, a, a guy who's in, in Canada um, in the same industry as what we're in. So we uh, that would be more in the civil environment, um, doing very similar things to what we're doing. Um, at the same time, not really a competitor. So it was just great to exchange details. Met a student from China, um, mm -hmm. busy with his PhD. And I think he really enjoyed it because, uh, you know, he's obviously at home for, for seven or eight months now with COVID uh, studying. So it was probably nice for him to also meet people. Um, yeah. And just to see what, what kind of talent is out there is amazing. Okay, okay. That's awesome. And you've uh, listened to, as I understand, quite a few podcast episodes or sh episodes on this show. How does it feel to be on the show yourself now? No, it's, uh, I'm, I still have to pinch myself to, I, I told my <laughs> wife about it. <laughs> I think at first she didn't believe me, but um, I'm here and it's, it's amazing. I'm really looking forward to connecting to people and um, yeah, thanks for the opportunity. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. Um, topic for today. So everybody knows is digital twins. I'm super excited to dive in. And I was like, when, when you said on, at data science go, like you, you're in, did you, you're in that uh, space of digital twins and that's what you do. It's like, Oh, I gotta get him on the podcast. Cause we only had like one guest before speaking about this and it's a really burning topic. Um, but before we dive into it, uh, a bit about uh, South Africa. Uh, like I, uh, as, as we just kind of like briefly mentioned before the episode, I, <laughs> I think it's a great country. Uh, when we lived in Zimbabwe, I, we did trips to South Africa, like, you know, weekend or maybe like maybe a five day trip. Um, fantastic. My, play, my favorite place is Sun City. It's a wonderful city. Yeah, of course, Cape Town, Johannesburg. Great place, yeah. How, how's uh, how's uh, the situation in South Africa? And more importantly, how is uh, data science in South Africa? these days? Yes. Yeah, so um, I, I, for, for those who don't know much about South Africa, we've got a, a very checkered history, um, lots of political shifts over the past decade or two. And um, that's made it an interesting mix of cultures in South Africa. Um, what, what that's meant is that there's been a lot of progress on the human aspects in terms of our, uh, we've got a, a, I think, rated one of the best constitutions in the world. And, um, and, you know, uh, freedom uh, for people is, is extremely important. At the same time, there's been quite, uh, we call it a bit of the brain drain, um, lots of people leaving overseas, which is not really such a big issue if you take into consideration we could do a lot of work remotely nowadays. But I think um, we, we're definitely seeing a gap between, um, you know, uh, wage incomes and obviously you've, you've got the challenge of, trying to address social, political, economic issues. And I think data science is, is a, a really powerful tool for that in our country. So um, a, a unique place to be applying it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's uh, um, like wor the world's moving forward and we are seeing quite a lot about ethics and equality in the space of data science, like a lot of discussions in that space. So this is a great time to, um, you know, for all countries to implement these things. And uh, definitely, I think um, South Africa 
uh, could benefit from a lot of a lot of um, the developments in the space. Yep. No, definitely. Um, and uh, yeah, I think we we definitely able with technology nowadays to to get people educated and up to speed within the country. So the the main thing is just enabling people through you know learning new skills. There's so much out there that really um, they just need to know which platforms to reach out to. Question: Which city are you in, by the way? I'm in um, uh, Pretoria, sort of mid midway between Johannesburg and Pretoria, the capital. So. Uh -huh. um, yeah, in the heart, in the heart of the busy business <laughs> center of South Africa. Okay, okay, question, cool. Um, all right, well, yeah, South Africa, and I like what you mentioned that uh, a lot of things can actually be done virtually. This, uh, this is an interesting time that, especially with this coronavirus, that more and more people are going to recognize that, and you know, maybe people in different countries it's not going to be like oh if you're in the US you're you know helping the US economy all the time and so on or in, in you know in in uh, UK you're always how like you have the opportunities and so like as you say uh, there's a big landscape for data science in um, South Africa uh, because I guess it's not as competitive as like the Silicon Valley and maybe people will be able to help or or contribute to uh, some projects yeah, be cool. yeah, no, definitely. That's that's. Um, I think one of our aims is to to reach out and and get get, uh, get as much work done for overseas companies to keep us competitive, um, mm -hmm. and at the same time use the skills we we learn to you know train new younger and younger generation within the country. Nice, that's very cool. Hope you're enjoying this amazing episode. We'll get back to it after this quick short announcement. And the quick short announcement is that we have Data Science Go Connect. Uh, you've probably already heard of Data Science Go, which is the conference we run in California. You've probably also heard of Data Science Go Virtual, the virtual conference we run several times per year. And in order to help our community stay connected throughout the year, uh, we started running these uh, events, virtual events, which happen every single month. So you can find them at datasciencego.com slash connect. They're absolutely free. Uh, you can sign up at any time. And then once a month, we run an event where uh, you will uh, get uh, to hear from a speaker. There'll be panel dis or a panel discussion, uh, maybe an industry expert Q&A. Uh, but very importantly, there's also uh, speed networking sessions where you can meet like-minded data scientists from around the world. This is a great way to stay up to date with industry trends, hear from amazing speakers, and also meet peers and uh, exchange details and stay in touch with the community. So once again, uh, these events run monthly uh, and you can sign up at datasciencego.com slash connect. We'd love to see you there. Well, on that uh, note, let's move on to uh, your work. So uh, you work in the very interesting space of uh, digital twins uh, or simulations. Uh, the company is called Simulation Engineering Technologies or SET, and it's part of a group called Foresight. So quick uh, uh, rundown like tell us a bit about the companies like the structure or the main the main mission objectives um, just a bit to know what what uh, it's all about yeah sure so the company currently consists of about five uh, subgroups subsidiaries um, these joined together uh, and it's uh, roughly about five years ago but each of the companies themselves have a good 20 plus years experience in their respective fields Mm -hmm. And um, I think it was about four years ago, they, they listed on the Johannesburg Stock, Stock Exchange. Um, mm -hmm. Big moment for, for us. Yeah. And I'll, I'll be honest, the, thanks. Uh, the past few years have been uh, uh, quite exciting. It hasn't come without its own challenges. Um, you know, uh, board changes and uh, a new, new management, uh, internal management um, coming in. And uh, ever since then, we've seen uh, a, a lot more steady growth. And I think what makes it so exciting is that um, it's it's such a new new field, not just digital twins, but um, I'm going to throw a buzzword in here, but the industry 4.0. Um, so this group of companies, uh, obviously, I'm with a simulation group, but we we all have various different uh, domains of expertise. So we've got software development, we've got uh, telecoms, we've uh, we've got uh, advanced process control. Um, and then uh, the simulation modeling is fits in at more of a strategic level within businesses. So we cover 
from low level, um, I call it devices and hardware to mm -hmm. very high level strategic kind of work, which makes it very exciting. Wow, fantastic. Um, uh, so that's your division covering uh, the low level insights and the strategic. Uh, so we actually do more the high level. Um, so we'll get into the digital twins. Yeah. And basically what uh, what that means is that our simulation models get hooked onto uh, the actual live uh, company or organization systems mm -hmm. to make them digital twins. And then then you get access to all the low-level data from, oh, okay. from various devices. Cool. Okay. So uh, you mentioned uh, the buzzword uh, Industry 4.0. What does that mean? Right. So as, as far as I understand it, I mean, these things always... Um, Get a few uh, tales put on on the stories, but uh, the German government decided a, a number of years ago to to come up with this term industry 4.0 and um, to incentivize the integration of of automation and and digital systems. Mm -hmm. um, so the first in, first industrial revolution was your your steam steam train steam engines. Second, mm -hmm. your uh, elect, electrical systems. Mm -hmm. And then the third would have been, um, let's say, the, the creation of the computers, the internet, uh, mm -hmm. telecoms. So the fourth industrial revolution looks at integrating all of that and uh, just sharing data between any platform and optimizing your industrial systems. Mm -hmm. So very much your, um, yeah, your future view of where technology is going. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Very cool. So. How how far uh, are we into the in, uh, fourth industrial revolution? So I think um, it's we're very new in it. Um, obviously, certain countries are way ahead of others, and I think South Africa is probably lagging quite a bit. And then at the same time, you've got industries that are ahead and others that are lagging. So mining and manufacturing, the two industries we we largely focus on, are definitely laggards in in that sense because you still have a big component of the human element in there. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas, let's say, entertainment, uh, telecoms are probably further ahead because, you know, there's so much more you could automate and, and put online these days. Yeah. Um, so I think the, the futures, uh, we're going to see that that curve of uh, maturity is going to keep on accelerating for the next five mm -hmm. years. Um, yep. So I think fairly early. Yeah, man, it's interesting, like, with this mining industry, uh, I got a really cool example of how, like what you said, that some, some, in some case, in many cases, they're lagging behind. In some cases, it's surprising how far ahead, like, there's in uh, Western Australia, there's this uh, Rio Tinto mine of the future. And they started, I think, in 2008 or something, like, that, like, ages ago. And they have these automated trucks, a fleet of 200 trucks that rock up, and then the excavator puts the the soil and stuff in the truck the truck goes and it's all like 200 trucks are run by like i don't know a team of 15 data scientists they you know uh, people logistics people sitting somewhere remotely um so some are ahead but then some mines it's like every single mine is like its own little story as opposed to telecoms which are like competing fiercely for you know attention mines have their own um, as I understand, they have their, their own deposits of minerals and whatever else, and they need to work on them as long as they can get them out at a price that's, or like at a cost that's lower than the market price. It's a commodity, right? You can sell as much of it as you want. Uh, they're, they're making profit. So they're not really bothered in many cases about you know, the, these things. And so the story I have is, uh, like, I, I know this from, uh, from a friend and, uh, um, like I won't disclose the name of friend or the, the company, the mining company, but basically and one money company, like what are they? They are like I think like separating. Um, they like they get this ore and they need to crush it down into little things before they put it through a chemical process to extract like you know what gold or whatever it is, silver, platinum. Uh, so the way they crush it is they put it into like a big kind of like big spinning thing that uh, like a like a like a what's it called? Uh, oh, like a washing machine, right? Like a big washing machine, right? And, and so. It's huge, you know, like I think three stories high, like something 30 meters, or no, what, 20 meters or so. And um, yeah. it's got like big metal balls in there. And so like they, as, as it goes, these metal balls fall and they fall down and they hit the, the ore and they crush it. And so it's like spinning and the ore is falling, crushing it. And um, so you can imagine like a washing machine, 
20 meters high with metal balls inside and you chuck in the ore, they fall down, crush it. The question is like, how fast do you spin it, right? So do you, sp you spin it too fast, then the metal balls will go up too high and they won't be falling at the optimal angle and you'll be wasting electricity, which is a ton of electricity, uh, you know, for inefficiency. If you spin it too slow, the metal balls won't have enough velocity when they hit the ore and they won't be crushing it as effective. So there's like an optimal speed. And so my, my friend tells me this story. He's like, the way they find the optimal speed, I, you're probably going to laugh, laugh me out of the room here. He's like, the way they find the optimal speed, and this is like a mine offshore, you know, like some, uh, some island somewhere or, you know, some country where you get expats, people with a lot of experience in this specific thing. They come and they, they walk around like they... They are very important indeed, but they don't want to really share their knowledge because that's their, their, um, you know, their secret, their secret source. So what they do is like this guy yeah. has been doing this for 20 years. He comes up to this uh, machine and they all have to wear earphones, you know, to protect them and so on. So he comes up to this machine and like uh, to the wall of it, not the spinning wall, but the outer wall. And he takes his earphone, ear, ear thing off, puts his ear to it and like listens to how many hits, you know, he hears, how many metal balls he hears per minute. And then from that, he's like, yeah, we need to speed it up or we need to slow it down. Like, boom, like how ridiculous <laughs> is that, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, that's, that sounds very familiar. And um, I, I don't know, this is probably, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but probably quite a relatively advanced mind. Um, um, I but, don't know much uh, about it, but yeah. <laughs> no, we, we have all those stories, uh, you know, of rudimentary ways of people doing things all the time. So I think uh, the mining, um, when you're on site, it's an engineer's playground because mm. there's, it sounds simple, the processes, you know, there's, there's a, a one commodity flowing on a conveyor, uh, goes through a crusher, the plant, and then out the other side. But there's so many cool little inventions along the way of the way people have done things. So um, I, I, li I like the mining industry. They've got a, a chute where you've got the ore, and they've got a big, I think it's like a 20-story building. Um, mm. So the ore on the final step goes all the way up to this top of this building. And the way they get the diamonds out of it is this, this ore falls all the way through the building and they've got a little laser. So there's the tech park um, that shines a light. And when it picks up a reflection on this ore falling, then it knows, okay, there's a diamond. And then it wow. actually shoots a little, <laughs> it shoots a little bit of uh, like a jet, a jet stream of air yeah. and pushes, pushes that, all into another bucket and that's that's how they, they get the diamonds out at the end so that's crazy um yeah <laughs> yeah Amazing. that's cool that's cool like so so some things are like that that's cool automation right and there there's uh i forgot the company that does it but there's there's some companies that do that for mining companies but th some things are well automated and well like designed but some things are like so prehistoric and i can see what you mean like they're they're lagging you need the whole system to be uh, updated and to be using AI to its full potential to be like if you have a few uh, ch links in the chain that are not automated to that extent like you you there's room for improvement yeah yeah I'm not sure um, and and what we we try and do is we we try and integrate the first step is is digital transformation get get all the systems digitized uh, automated as far as possible it doesn't mean remove the human element it just means yeah. automate it uh, a part of it once you've digitized, you can analyze, we call it digitize, analyze, optimize. So, um, it, you know, understand what's going on in the biggest system. And then when you get to the optimized step, that's where the, the simulation comes in. So what's, what's great about the simulation is we take all the data typically sit in the office offsite, build the model of the entire system. It could be a couple of mines actually put together. Mm -hmm. And then we understand where's the biggest constraint within the mm -hmm. system. And that's where we focus on. So, um, yeah, it's nice to combine sort of the high level, low level view. Awesome. And, and okay. then you, you, yeah, and you also take into consideration the human element. Very cool. Uh, so let's talk about digital twins then. What's, what's the definition of digital twins? And as I told you, I did some homework, so I watched some videos. So I also have a definition prepared, one by IBM actually. So we can compare and uh, let's talk about the topic. What are digital twins? Yes, yeah, so I've I've actually decided to um, uh, when when people ask me that question, I stay away from pure definitions because yeah. I, I'm of the opinion that these things are, are to a degree constantly evolving. The same with the term uh, data science to a degree, and I I mean you you probably know way more than me on the topic 
Um, but you know, as as technology is evolving, you know, these these things are just growing, and and to even understand all of this in your mind becomes quite complex. But um, our definition of a digital twin is when you have a a model that represents the um, the real life system. Um, you you've now abstracted that the, that system onto a model, and the model is never exactly perfect. It can never be exactly the same as a real thing. Um, that's a whole philosophy on its own. But uh, once you now integrate that model with your life system, um, in in other words, you are getting data uh, directly fed from from the system in real time. And real time is also a very relative term. You could have something running for real time one second or every 10 seconds or 10 hours, whatever. But for, for the in industry and environment you're in, once that data is fed real time, then in our, in our terms, you end up with a digital twin representative of that. And it's, it's across the life cycle system. So you, you actually start building a model before the system is, is uh, implemented. So in design phase, and that model lives on all the way through to decommissioned phase at the end. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah, no, that's very cool. So, uh, as I understand, there's a very good, important clarification you made that, that it has to be updated live with data. So you can't just like build a digital twin like of an airplane and then just okay, now there's this airplane and then there's this digital twin and like that's it. They're separate. Like you have to whenever you can update the data. Yes, yes, and I think that's also we we use the term loosely because obviously it's. Um, it's a growing field and, and people like to hear that you're doing digital twins. But I think uh, what we often try, we try and explain that to our clients um, because we, we're not, I think in any specific industry, we have that perfect digital twin. Yet. You're always going to have some aspect of it that might be left out or might be at a strategic level. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. So, yeah, the, the ABM definition is pretty much the same. So we're going to go through that. Um, but another thing you pointed out, they also, in this video I watched on YouTube, they also point out that they, a digital twin is, uh, um, has like helps with three phases. It helps with the design phase, the build phase of the, whatever it is you're building and the operation phase. So like, I used to think that, oh, it's only just for the operations part, but actually it's, it's for all three. So, so you even create the digital twin even before. How does that work? Like, do you create the digital twin before the design phase or do you create the digital twin uh, like to, to inform the design phase? Is that right? Yep. Yeah. So I think uh, probably the, uh, I always like to break problems down to something like a toy problem, something small. Um, so an easy way to understand this is when you're building a house, um, you, might, you might start a sketch on a piece of paper. So that, that's already getting the creative process going, but then you start putting that into a CAD program on a computer. So they already got a digitized model going. Um, yeah. And then obviously, as you start building this house, um, you know, the, the model might even be refined and to a degree, the model's living alongside. So that's, I think, how, how you could see it informing the design. Um, and I've, I'm actually working on an interesting um, project at the moment where there, there's an existing plant. Um, it's for manufacturing industry, and uh, we the the plant exists. So we've got a good idea of what kind of model to build. But they want to do a new plant, mm -hmm. um, greenfield. So now we using our model to inform the design. Once the design's done, they they obviously go into building it and operating it, and our model lives alongside that. But then they want to do expansion. So then once again, we, we informing on a design level so that this is sort of an iterative process between mm -hmm. design and execution and operation. Mm -hmm. And digital twins can be used uh, at like all sorts of scales, right? Like you can be at the scale of a plant, it can be at the scale of one machine, um, it can be at the scale of like even a human, right? You could have a digital twin of, of an organ of your heart or something like that and feed data to it from your... Uh, I don't know, like you might have like a heart implant or from your Apple Watch or something like that and and just observe like how that changes and get informed. Like, tell us a bit about that. What, what are some of the common or most exciting use cases of digital twins out there? Yeah, so uh, I think you hit it spot on. Um, I mean, 
if you if you look at uh, social networking, so I'm obviously talking about platforms like your LinkedIn, Facebook. Um, in essence, those are starting to create uh, digital twins of of people. And I mean, obviously, it's up to the company uh, how ethically they use it. So I won't get into that debate. But um, someone uh, was for looking, that, right? The social dilemma. Have you seen it? Yes, that's exactly yeah. the one I'm thinking of. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, if somebody... yes, so I think they. They they bring it out in the um in the way that they portray this this person um, yeah. making decisions for him. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, so very absolutely. interesting. Good 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 watch. Good movie to watch. And then delete your social Excellent. media accounts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um so yes, uh, some I was working for an uh, aerospace company and I think that's probably the most I, I learned. From uh, from that industry on technology and um, digital twins, actually to a degree, because the the aerospace defense environment, I think there's a lot of history of it. Going, obviously, going back to World War II, so they actually worked out a lot of things on pen and paper, which we are using in our systems today. And I think you know, for someone that hasn't been in that environment, that that history just gets lost. But this uh, this one one guy I was working for, he said. Uh, you get a creating system and you get a a making system. So there's a, a system that's uh, what did he referred it to as um, the made system and the create and the creating system. So uh, for example, in a mine, you would have a plant um, and the mine itself would be the creating system, and the ore would be the. It, it sounds weird to say it, but a created system. The same goes for, uh, let's say. Uh, aerospace, well, building aeroplanes, you've got the creating system, your manufacturing plant, and the created system is your aeroplane. So um, it goes it goes a lot more beyond just a certain product. Um, and that kind of opens your mind to thinking about any industry um, in a new way. So the interesting question is with social, uh, social platforms, who's the creating system and who's the created system? <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. So, yeah. So, so like that's very interesting. So you have the creating system and you have the created system, right? So as you said, in in planes, you have the factory is your creating system, the plane is your created system. But did you say that in in mining it's the other way around? Like the ore is your creating system and the mining plant is actually the created system. It's it, no, it's it's the same in in mining. It's the same. I think that. The, yeah, the difference is that your created system is a very, I don't want to say less complex system, but it's not, um, it's not an interactive system. You've got all that comes out at the end. But oh, um, it's not you know, an system, Yeah, exactly. Yeah, okay. So the, the, the plant is the creating system, the ore coming out at the end is created system. And so the question in the social dilemma, right? Like what, what is, uh, what's the like creating and what's the created, right? Yes, yes. So, um, yeah, I, th I suppose at the end of the day, I mean, social dilemma talks about us as being the product. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, I think uh, I mean I don't have a particular view about it. I think it doesn't help to to think too um, negatively about these kind of things. But if you've got a digital twin, the closer that comes to representing a human being, um, once once that um, platform starts. Uh, providing insights to the human being on on the decisions it should make instead yeah. of the other way around, then you've got an interesting situation. But just yeah. to get back to um, the mining versus the manufacturing example, I think what what opened my eyes there as well is that, you know, you've got these industries that look to a degree vastly different, but reviewing the, the manufacturing plant as a creating system um, and taking what one learns there in terms of data science you could take that and apply that to an industry such as mining. Um, if you understand that now all of a sudden your created system is not so complex, it might be higher volumes, um, but you could still use the same, uh, let's say, algorithms and and uh, knowledge there just in a different way. Okay. So it's transferable knowledge. Yep. Hmm, that's really cool. Uh, how is data science in... Uh, digital twins different to data science in machine learning? Yeah. So I think um, 
for for us, where where we do a lot of simulation work before they go into mm-hmm. digital twins, um, there's a abstraction of of the real world data. We might get info from spreadsheets, and we the models we built on built on a lot of assumptions, and and we calibrate these models to make sure they represent the the real life system. But given these assumptions, you know, you you kind of do these long longer periods of studies on your own, whereas with machine learning AI applied to a real world system, uh, hooked, you know, directly working on the live, live data, um, it's an interesting dynamic. You get feedback a lot quicker, and you actually see um, the results of your efforts a lot quicker. You know, if I if I change this lever on a conveyor belt or specify a certain um, algorithm for uh, processing the ore in a certain way, uh, a week later, you'll already see the results of that. Whereas with strategic modeling, um, yeah, you you typically would give a report and a lot of that is based on assumptions and there would be interpretation. So there's there's quite a bit of a difference. Um, mm-hmm. And we use more heuristic algorithms, whereas AI is not so relevant in the simulation modeling. Mm-hmm. Okay, heuristic, you mean like as opposed to like if else algorithms as opposed to brute force just process all the data algorithms. Yeah. Yes, why is that? Correct. Yeah. Oh, so why is uh why do why you do use, use why do you use heuristics, right? Like it's it, uh, heuristics like for instance if we look at um uh what's it called? Um the the game of go, right? versus chess. Like Deep Blue back in the 1998 or whatever beat Kasparov based on heuristics, right? Like if else lots of scenarios picking in the right one and so on. Whereas uh AlphaGo or now AlphaGo Zero uh, is just brute forcing its way through uh, with deep learning algorithms and uh, not going through all the possible combinations because that's impossible, but it's actually like uh, just learning on the go. So why in the digital twin space do you still use heuristics rather than allowing AI uh, using something like deep learning and allowing AI to learn on its own? Yeah, no, that's an interesting question. It's actually got quite a lot of context to it. So I think the first thing I, I left out up front is that our models are um, largely or are digital twins. You get mm-hmm. different types. Ours is uh, processed digital twins. So you would have digital twins of a physical system. So the airplane, again, is a good example. You're doing uh, fluid dynamics, uh, um, you know, uh, CFDs and uh, all sorts of other calculations around the engine of, a, of an airplane. So that's not what we do. We do process digital twins. We look, it's actually something you can't always see. Um, mm-hmm. So we model the process and then we, you know, come up with answers to how to optimize that system. Um, so that's the, that's the first distinction, which means that um, our models, the simulation models we build are not uh, purely they're data driven, but they're not. We actually build a physical layout of a site. Um, and the heuristics come in where you've got, let's say, um, someone, a truck has to drive from one side of a plant to another. They've got three different routes they could take. Which one should they take? So you don't really, you obviously AI would help you there. Um, but, you know, for the sake of the type of projects we work on, coming up with a heuristic to say, you know, choose, choose a path with a, the least traffic on. Uh, those those kind of rules makes it a lot easier and it's more transferable to the actual operation because oh, you okay. might not have trucks working with that AI. But then we do have the, the simulation per definition runs brute force lots of scenarios to test what which would be the best outcome. Gotcha. Gotcha. So the way I understand with the heuristics is that you have certain constraints that exist in the real world and you just have to adhere to them. So you gotta code them in as heuristics. Yeah, that's right. Gotcha. Uh, you said simulations. What kind of simulation algorithms do you use? Right. So we uh, we rely on uh, software, proprietary software that we use to build our models. Um, the one package we use is Simio. So we're agnostic to different tools, but we found this this package to work really well, and that allows us to to build almost any kind of physical um, environment where you where you have to hook your process model onto some physical layout. So the truck, trucks is a good example there. Um, you'd struggle to do that maybe in a MATLAB where you can't physically see the trucks move and understand what the dynamics are. Um, and then 
we we hook that model onto an interface like uh, let's say Power BI or Tableau, and um, that gives us that capability for client to obviously publish the dashboard to um, you know everyone in the organization or just as a as a, as a presentation. Um, and it also makes the the whole process of of doing a study a lot quicker. And then if we need to, we start um, using something like Python or or R if we need to do really difficult calculations, typically up front before we do the model. Um, and then also if we, that can help us to do the visualization aspect as well. So um, yeah, it's it's a fairly it's a nice it's a narrow but nice tool set to work with. Okay, gotcha. Um, what does your day to day look like? Right. So <laughs> I typically, um, uh, we, the environment I work in is a very flexible environment. Um, you know, we, what I like about the work we do is we work independently, uh, together in, in groups on projects, but very independently. So your deliverables, um, you know, are directly attributed, attributed to your work. Which means I, I could work remotely, um, you know, anywhere if I wanted to, uh, or go into the office. And um, we've got a very collaborative environment. So um, each day is is kind of uh, has its own way of panning out. But obviously, there's a lot of planning that goes into it upfront. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, so, do you like, for instance, if you're on a project, do you do the whole end to end, or do you do a specific part of the, the digital twin project? Yeah, so because these, uh, let's take mining um, as an example, these, uh, because these mines uh, have such a long life cycle, I mean, some mines you easily get up to uh, 50 year life of mine. So you might come in, this mine might be 30 years old, and you you jump in and build a model that has to model the operations. So no, no design influence there. Um, mm. On other projects, you might be in conceptual phase. Um, mm-hmm. which has a very dynam- different dynamic on its own. And then you've got the manufacturing projects, which are typically shorter term. So the example I gave where we're starting off, you know, right at inception, and if all goes well, we'll continue with that for the next couple of years. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, okay, gotcha. Yeah. Uh, but like in your specific day, you, you, you know, like how some, some companies, they pigeonhole you into one like specific, uh, okay, you're always going to be writing uh, Python code for this specific thing. Uh, do you get the opportunity to work across um, different tools and different um, challenges within a, an individual project, or, or do, you, are you, do you specialize in something? Yes. Yeah, so I, I think I had to make the call um, a couple of years ago whether I was going to go highly specialized or diversify, maybe even management. And I, I just found that I, I like both. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so. Um, I, I moved from a, a corporate uh, company to the company I'm at it now is, uh, is small within the larger group, which gives us a lot of autonomy. And I've had the opportunity in the past two years to work on, um, just to give you an example, I've done these simulation modules, which is actually a highly specialized kind of work. And I mean, we've got many guys going, doing master's, PhD. Um, and at the same time, I've been able to do uh, be a project manager of a digital transformation project for mine, looking at every single department um, and, uh, you know, coordinating a team of 30 or 40 people. So it's, it's really, it's been great to get the diversity, but I think um, at some point one has to make that call, which uh, I wouldn't say which specialization you're going to go into, but for long term, you want to keep building on the same thing. Um, Yeah. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. Um, I have an interesting uh, thing that we could do is like if you maybe a few more. We've already given a few examples of digital twin projects. Maybe we can do a few more. Like I have one. I'll start first. I have one that I found online um, where digital twins. Like just to give our audience a like a feel for oh well, okay what else can be digital twins be used for. So one I found really cool is like if you have a, a like a big uh, manufacturing plant and you have a robot or like basically a machine that needs to cut uh, like as in a straight line or like cut certain uh, like I don't know let's say a, a piece of a car right like a door it needs to cut the the metal in a certain shape um, 
that's really cool and they're very accurate. But because it's such a big manufacturing plant, there might be other things going on, um, like vibrations coming from like some big device hitting something or like doing some testing or something. So unless you have the luxury of having a huge space and you know everything isolated, great. But what if you're you're building this in a, a smaller confined space? Like if there's some certain vibrations, they can impact this machine. So in this case, you would build a digital twin. This is the part that was very impressive to me. You build a digital twin, not of just that robot that's cutting. You build a digital twin of the whole system, right? Of the whole um, manufacturing plant, and then you know exactly when these vibrations are happening, which way they're going, and so on. What's producing them? So you can then you can feed that information to the robot real time, and it can adjust by millimeters its cutting uh, trajectory to take those vibrations to account. So you don't have to stop it and wait for the vibrations to go away. You can actually use that while it's working. How cool is that? That's, that's amazing. So um, my mind's already going to that systems view where now you've got a, a um, you know, your created system might be your, your part, your car part that the plant's yeah. producing. Your creating system is your plant. But now you've got another third system around that interacting with, with both these two systems. So it just it blows your mind when you think of all the different um, scenarios. So yeah, I mean, that's, that's a brilliant example. And I think what people underestimate is, you know, you, you look at a, a plant, um, manufacturing plant, and you think, oh, well, I mean, there's complexity, there's the robots. Um, but from a process perspective, it could be incredibly complex to understand and optimize that as well as the part that's being produced. Yeah. Um, and so you've got digital twins of all these things popping up everywhere. Mm. Gotcha. Do you have a cool, like mind blowing example? Of a uh, digital twin in manufacturing? Or in anything really? Well, I, th I think- What's um, your favorite? I, I really uh, envy anyone that builds digital twins in, uh, in the aerospace field. I think that's, that's on another level. I mean, um, you the, the platforms that are being created, first of all, on the manufacturing side, you know, to to model the flow of how these parts get put together, having the right components ready at the right time. Then that engine is built, and now your designer who who designed this engine has his model, and that thing gets put in a plane, and um, you know the the he couldn't have seen up front exactly on that engine part how that would uh, you know what forces would uh, eventually end up interacting on that engine once it's up in there i mean obviously he models it and he's got all the experience and insight that goes into that but only once that thing is up in the air and let's say something goes wrong then um, he might get the opportunity to get that engine back download the data, um, you know, obviously stored on, on that platform and then in, see what happened between the model and the engine, what, what exactly happened there. So I've, I've got another example um, from the defense industry we worked in where we, we built parts that um, actually detect if, you know, you were being fired at from a long range. Uh, and this part had to pick up the direction, the azimuth and um, the, the heading at which this, let's call it now missile is coming in at. So just by the way, all, all the work we did was, was defense, not, uh, mm -hmm. not, um, attacking, but, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so, so now you've got this, this model of how this part should be working to pick up, you know, all these things firing at it, but now you put it on a helicopter and now you've got a whole new dynamic because this helicopter is moving, um, their weather conditions. So how, how do you build a thing like that without being able to test it? You can't just go quickly outside, put it on a couple of million dollars worth of, uh, you know, um, aerospace equipment and, or, or um, aviation equipment and see what would happen. You kind of have to wait for, for that part to be put on a platform. A year later, it actually gets, gets into um, the field. So, um, I mean, the, the amount of, of skill you have to have to get something like that to work properly is, is truly amazing. Mm. And then you wait until it needs to get shot at and then, <laughs> and then, exactly. and then only you can test it out. That's crazy. Um, 
Cool, cool. Uh, what's what's the future of um, digital twins, and where where are we heading to? Is like everything gonna have a digital twin? Is like my chair gonna have a digital twin? <laughs> like how how does it look like? Yes, I think um, uh, hopefully the human race will be. Uh, oh, I'm sure the human race will be clever enough not to apply to everything. Mm-hmm. Um, I think there are just th- certain things that it becomes overkill. Um, I've I've actually decided to go with a a relatively cheap Casio watch because I I just want to know the time. I don't have to have notifications come up on my phone the whole time. But yeah. um, I think it's inevitable that we are going to have we're going to see uh, integration of or digitization on on almost every single platform you can think of. So I think I I just hope that we we stay. Um, in control of the technology and and it doesn't uh, become a master of us um, and I think if if we can do that um, you know the the future outlook looks great um, so yeah <laughs> how soon will we have um, you know our day to day lives impacted it's really cool to hear about stories from manufacturing and mining and you know other other industries but how soon will we notice an impact in our day-to-day lives by digital twin from digital twins yes i think um uh the 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 people in in control of the digital twins um i would definitely say can already in industry see the power of it and uh, it's making their lives a lot easier Unfortunately, if you're at the receiving end of that, um, in, in terms of you know losing the control of the, the digital twins, where it might be replacing your job, um, then then obviously you're not even going to really know about it. Um, on a personal level, I think we we're definitely seeing it with social media, uh, the impact um, mm. of of digital twins in our lives. Which is negative. <laughs> is there any positive examples? <laughs> so. Yeah, I think they're, they're definitely positive examples. Uh, the past few months with COVID, where we haven't been able to be in contact with family and friends. I mean, the technology's been amazing to help connect people. And then um, we've also, I've got many friends overseas, and it's great to keep in, in contact. You know, you, you don't always have the time, especially with a family, you don't have the time to uh, call someone or arrange a call. So just to see that they're doing okay, um, you know, they're loving life. Um, I think that's that's great. You mean like social media? Social media, yeah. Instagram, yeah. Uh, Facebook, whichever it is. But what about digital twins? What, do you have an example of uh, digital twins impacting or maybe soon impacting our day-to-day lives in a positive way? Well, I think um, I, I'm really excited about... Um, the the resurrection of the space race. <laughs> mm. So I think uh, digital twins are going to be invaluable in in exploring space, um, whether it's going to new planets or sending sending equipment up to do exploration. So um, I think I think that's brilliant. Um, okay. I can't think of a more noble more noble cause for digital twins than that. <laughs> okay, gotcha. All right. Um, I, I've I've got an example. Uh, also, a bit more down to earth example. Um, for instance, uh, what's it called? Digital twins. Oh yeah, IBM uses digital twins to uh, control, like the to analyze the comfort levels in their offices and and how people navigate through, um, you know, like what paths they take to walk, and then like they restructure the the layout of the office to uh, using that information. That's uh, I think another way that maybe people working in offices will see maybe maybe we'll have that for homes you know maybe things like what's it called nest right that controls your temperature in your home maybe once that is integrated with a digital twin of your home it can uh, even better do its job yes yes no definitely and i that you just triggered a, another thought of mine is that we we also do digital twins in the transportation industry so a lot for rail networks um and uh, I've actually heard it was a couple of years we were visiting Australia. They, um, the Australia, uh, what do you call it, public transport, is is really excellent. Um, I, I was I was amazed by what what you've got going there. But 
um, the way that they're using data to optimize uh, transport uh, traffic. So apparently, I don't know if this is this must be in, in implemented by now, but um, you know, to regulate the traffic lights based on yeah. uh, congestion. Um, oh, okay. I mean, that, yeah, that's that's brilliant. <laughs> that's a really cool. So that would be a digital twin as well, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You'd have you, can't, you can't get away with. Sorry, you can't get away with just like okay, this one road will put a sensor or like a, even a machine learning algorithm, and so on. you need like the whole system. You need to know okay, if we put a green light here. What will happen three roads down? What will happen on this block? Or no, there's like a fire truck coming here. You know, we need like the whole thing working together. Yep. Yeah. And obviously you would need some kind of AI there because just to come up with basic uh, rules or even do mass uh, simulations to understand that flow, you, you're not going to get it in time. So you need you need a system that can make take a vast amount of inputs, lots of massive data and make those decisions very quickly. Yeah. And learn yeah, from you, as it goes on. You raise a good point. Uh, uh, digital twins are um, like a big thing with, <laughs> it's like funny, I thought of it for, I thought for like three seconds, the best word I could have come up with thing. <laughs> it's, it's so funny, a big <laughs> thing. Anyway, is a, they're a big deal for, uh, yeah, for cities, right? Like I heard uh, San Diego, for instance, in the US, they, they're working with some uh, and somebody was on the podcast. I, I just don't remember the episode number um, or the the exact who the guest was. But somebody was talking about how they're working with City of San Diego to build a digital twin of a, like a lot of things that are going on from infrastructure to like you know pipes and electricity and so on to, to roads and networks and so on to optimize to allow the city to operate efficiently because like we're growing, you know, populations are growing, right? Like all, we always have, like LA, for instance, is stuck in traffic like a lot of the time. And a lot of cities are facing these problems. And the, yet there are times when, you know, there's no cars on the roads, you know, like in the middle of the night, you know, why, why not do road works there? Or, you know, whatever else. But cities have so much data, so much going on, they're like drowning. A lot of them are drowning in all this. And humans are not capable of, even teams of humans are not capable of just like sitting down, okay, let's make these decisions. So... And, and then test it out, you know, like roll it out. Let's see what happens in the next month in our city. You know, like with a digital twin, like the benefit is you can simulate stuff and you can like roll it, roll out these different scenarios and see what happens before you actually implement them in the real world and suffer the consequences. Yes, that's that's actually a field that I'm so interested in. It's, I think we just, um, in South Africa, we, we're not mature yet for that, but in terms of infrastructure, but um, my I come from a family of architects and so buildings and um, design of buildings really interests me. And the, the big movement in that is now, uh, they call it BIM. So I think there's a, a term called BIM 360, Building Information Modeling. And mm -hmm. um, that basically means that exactly the same digital twin concept you're applying to buildings. So you've got your, your model, um, you know, construct your building, but then you actually end up with sensors in your building. So you're getting temperature information, vibration information, electric, electrical information, all of that getting fed into a model. And, you know, you could optimize whatever you wanted there. Um, and, and obviously the possibilities are very big. But now apply that to a city. Um, and I think you've got some really good uh, or powerful capability to, you know, um, take, take a city and just make it better in whichever ever aspect you look. Um, mm -hmm. Whether it's, you know, getting better use of electricity, optimizing traffic flow um yeah even social you know, social aspects of where people meet and and move around yeah and you got a lot of sensors right you got like a lot of uh you could have a sensor on every corner on every video or on every on every window um like that's that's so much information coming in yep, yep. um okay uh, what, what's your advice for a somebody who's starting into the space of data science or maybe transitioning from like a, some other background into data science, what's your advice for them to, if they're interested in exploring the space of uh, digital twins and simulation more, and like they want to direct their career, maybe direct their career path in that direction? Like what, what, what recommendation would you give? Okay, so I think the my suggestion would be is um, before you decide, the, I mean, the, the world of data science, AI, machine learning is so big. Um, before you, you decide where in that field you want to go, is first to decide which domain do you want to apply this in. 
So um, I, I heard a, a comment once where someone said, um, you know, you have to define the problem before you choose the tool. Don't let the tool determine the problem. Um, you know, not to go out and just do data science for the sake of data science, but actually figure out, you know, where do you want to apply this? And because that's, in my opinion, um, that's going to spur on your passion for whatever you're doing. Because I think it's important to have understanding of the real world implications of what you're busy with, uh, especially with this world becoming so, um, you know, interconnected. You don't always have the view of well, the, the greater impact of what you're doing. Yeah. And then I would say in terms of simulation modeling, there's some really good courses um, on simulation modeling. So you could have a look at uh, Simio is the one platform, any logic. Um, there's there's quite a number of them. That's that's more on the process level, and um, uh, look at a couple of courses, and then identify which which kind of company you want to work with. And I actually listened to your part, the previous podcast on um, you know career career success, and I think that advice is brilliant to say um, you know uh, you know luck is when when hard work uh, preparation meets opportunity. So then just uh, stick at looking for those opportunities and put in the hard work while you can uh, in preparation for that. Awesome. And I think this will be a cool um, time to kind of revisit or maybe or like cement it in because this is an important choice, right? Like you said, process system, process digital twins versus system digital twins. Like in a nutshell, you already talked a bit about this, but in a nutshell, like What's the difference and how does one pick which one they want to do? Yeah, so I think uh, on the process uh, side, they, I've got a, a bit more of an interest on the, the business level, how, how things impact on a business level. Um, so that's where, that's where processes are very important. If you are looking at being a lot more, of, let's say, your hardcore engineer, uh, working with materials, I would say look more at your physical digital twins. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, more the scientific. Yep. For sure. Okay, I understand. So process is business, uh, results, orientation, that side of things. And systems is like, how, how is this thing going to be designed? Or how is this thing working? Like you're more focused on the asset or the, the object itself. That's really cool. Thank you. That's, that clarifies it a lot. Awesome. Fantastic. Well, Tienes, um, what else? Uh, we're, we're coming to the end. So I wanted to know uh, very interesting work you're doing. If there's companies out there that want to work with your company and like want to get a consultation or um, you know, some, some maybe digital twin project, uh, or maybe there's somebody who's, like, who's very interested in this and wants to uh, like, uh, get a job in this space, how can they find um, your company, SCT or Foresight? Sure. So they could... Um... They could uh, do a Google of Foresight. So that's for the letter four and then site, S-I-G-H-T. Um, the the, the sub-company I work for is Simulation Engineering Technologies. If you Google that, you'll, you'll find our site directly. And then please feel free to add me on LinkedIn. Um, yeah, and you could even send me an email address to um, my email is tianas at setec.co.za. Mm -hmm. setec.co.za. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Cool. All right. And um, uh, what's uh, what's uh, da -da -da -da, one uh, final thing? You know, let's do the book first. What's a book you want to recommend to our listeners? Yeah. So I, I love reading books. I, I try to read at least three or four at a time, uh, slowly. And the one that I'm currently reading at the moment is um, Deep Work. By Cal Newport. Oh, I'm great actually, book! Oh, uh, you've you've read oh, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I, like I, I I read most or like more about half of it. Really cool insights. I love it. Totally cool. Yeah, no, brilliant. I'm actually reading the book, listening to the audiobook at the same time. Um, yeah. So just the whole philosophy. I think it's very applicable to data science. Yeah. Um, if you're gonna if you're gonna want to be a good data scientist, you're gonna have to put in. Uh, solid blocks of time, figure out your routine. So excellent book to read. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and uh, what's your 
one final piece of advice or like, I don't know, uh, wish for uh, listeners on the podcast in order to help them in their careers? Yeah, so uh, another book, uh, I'm going to take it from this book because it's meant a lot to me the last while. Um, so it's a book called The Slight Edge. And and basically, it's uh, you'll find these principles probably in, in most uh, career books, but it's it's just the idea of, of taking things uh, little bits at a time over a long period of time to realize that right now, you know, your dream is to be at a certain point three or four years from now. But focus on the year and now. Be, I heard a quote, be where your feet are and do the little bits, focus on the process, work towards the outcome. And when you look back over year or two, um, you'll be amazed by the re- results you see. That's cool. That's cool advice. Yeah. So a lot of time we get caught up trying to like shortcut to what yep. we want. That's not always, yep. <laughs> in most cases, it doesn't work. Got to put it. <laughs> yep. Tienes, it's been a huge pleasure. Thank you for joining me today. And I learned a lot about Digital Twins. Thank you. Thank you to you, Kirill. Really appreciate it. So there you have it, everybody. I hope you enjoyed this podcast as much as I did and got some valuable takeaways from it. My favorite part was how Tienes explained process Digital Twins versus system Digital Twins, and especially what he said at the end about career guidance like if you're interested in the object and the asset or or like the the design the materials behind something then you probably would be more interested in system digital twins whereas if you're interested in the business results and applications you might be more interested in the process uh, digital twins and of course there were plenty of other interesting takeaways as always, you can find the show notes at superdatascience.com slash 421. That's superdatascience.com slash 421. Uh, there you will also find the transcript for this episode, any materials that we mentioned on the podcast, and links to uh, the company where Tianis works in case you want to uh, talk to them about working together in your organization or maybe you're looking for a job. Tianis said they're always on the lookout for uh, talented and passionate people. And of course, you'll find the URL for TNS's LinkedIn. Make sure to connect with him too. And uh, yeah, so that's us for today. Uh, If you enjoy this episode and you know somebody who's interested in the space of simulations and digital twins, uh, or in general would like to broaden their knowledge of technology and this fourth industrial revolution, uh, feel free or uh, we would really appreciate it if you send them this episode and help spread the word. It's very easy to share. Just send them the link to perdayscience.com slash 421. On that note, uh, we appreciate your time and you being here today. I look forward to seeing you back here next time. Until then, happy analyzing.